Hi, this is Paul. This is the second part of a two-part video on the question, is secular humanism more fragile than Christianity? Now, I'm about to play the conclusion to part one, where I do some summary of part one and some introduction to part two, because I didn't initially intend to do this in two parts, but the thing just got too long. So I decided to split it up, do it in two parts. So this is the beginning of the second part. And what I will play right now is something that if you listen to the if you listen to part one all the way through, how I ended it. So I'm going to begin at the ending and then jump right in. Now I'm I've decided to I'm gonna take these off. I've decided to split this up into two parts. And the reason is because it's just so darn long. And I have various other reasons for this. So I'm gonna release one part and then a few days later I'll re release the second part. What I did in the first part is I, I posed the question, do we, do we have reason to believe that secular humanism is more fragile than Christianity? And we took a fairly deep dive into Nazism and, and Hitler's faith. Now, in all fairness, the church did not resist Hitler well. There were elements of the church, the confessing church, but, but many Germans were able to sort of piece together their Christianity and their Nazism, and, and that is a huge problem. So I don't want to pose the question imagining that, well, Christianity just always stands and, and never fails. Well, that's, that's not true. Christianity in the East, for example, with the, the rise of Islam, and that's another thing, I, want, I have too many things I want to study. Um, you know, Christianity was eaten by Islam to a significant degree. Um, Christianity endured communism in the Soviet Union and, and you know, managed to, to stay alive through that. Christianity has, has proven to be durable um, through through many things, but the church the church sometimes can can get to very small levels, and we've seen the decline in Europe of of Christianity and sort of this Christianity light that that Tom Holland talks about has seemed to have displaced much of Christianity, and there's just sort of a rump of a church that that endures, and this causes. Uh, Brits such as Tom Holland and 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 Douglas Murray to be anxious and worry that that if the if the if the memory gets too long then you can sort of lose the whole thing. So I don't want to overplay my argument. Now in the second part, I am going to change focus and we're going to look a little bit more at okay, kind of debunk the Nazi position that well. You know this this racial genetic only idea. Once again, Brett Weinstein wades in and notes the story verse is foundational, and we'll take a brief look at Robert Bella and his his attempt to integrate religion in the story of human evolution. Just some some bits from the introduction there, because Robert Bella also notes that it, it seems that you know as Brett Weinstein says this these two tracks both the genetic track and the cultural track. And and Robert Bella notes that what happens very quickly is that the culture track doesn't stay isolated from the, from the bottom track. It, of course, colonizes it. And this is a point that Jordan Peterson made many times, that 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 the human story verse gets into the natural selection and, and you can't really pull them apart. They... they you know they become intertwined and in fact very quickly the the culture track colonizes the other track and and what we're seeing now in terms of fears about eugenics about artificial intelligence and some of these things well yeah that's that's the continued colonization of the genetic track but in the second part i'm going to pay play significant portions from a piece that came across the discord server today that julian had posted um a rust to thought moderating a conversation at the American Enterprise Institute where where they're talking about well will another religion sort of displace Christianity in American culture and it's certainly not it's certainly not the kind of atheism that Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty are are proposing uh, will Christianity sort of recede as it did in Europe well that doesn't seem to be happening in fact 
both will get both will both of the the writers and scholars that that will speak will note that no we're we're incredibly religious but we don't we don't quite know what's going on in this religiosity and and i think uh, stephen smith from diego law school is going to make the argument i think quite compellingly that there's sort of a parasitic relationship between them and the the full-blown established institutional dominant religions so that's going to be in part two and i'll release part two probably a few days after this just in terms of uh for the sake of time so if you enjoyed part one stay tuned part two is coming now i played this video from from unbelievable brett weinstein talking to alistair mcgrath quite a few times where where brett makes the point that Human beings have two tracks of development going on simultaneously. The far slower genetic track, but then the culture track. And the culture track is, in, in some senses, what Hitler wanted to do was take out that culture track because he believed then the underlying genetic biological track could come to the fore and establish itself and, and proceed unimpeded. That's what fittedness was. Now, you know, why don't I play this again? I, I think it's, I think it's you know, a terrifically helpful video. Well, let, let's get into some of the meat of what we're talking about tonight. Um, I wonder if you could maybe give us a, a brief and hopefully layperson friendly account of, of how you imagine religious belief arose um, in, an in a strictly evolutionary sort of paradigm, Brett? Sure. So the first thing I would say is what we don't tend to understand when we take a strict classic Darwinian perspective about humans is that human beings are the far end of a continuum. Most creatures have essentially one mode of inheritance and it is genetic. We have a second mode and it is cultural and we are not completely alone. All of the other mammals have a cultural mode and almost all of the birds have it, but that's a tiny fraction of the biota. But for those creatures that do have this second mode, what you have is a, is a locale where information can be stored in a non-genetic form and it can be acted upon by the very same kinds of Darwinian forces that shape genes. Now, now what's interesting here, in, in a lot of the, the videos that we've been doing is we're we're dealing with kind of a perennial division we see it in now these divisions relate they don't necessarily map on each other perfectly they're sort of you see sort of the axial aids divi age division of of heaven and earth you see the mind matter division and and you see all of these divisions and here in a sense we have the genetic story division and, and all of these divisions don't necessarily map perfectly onto each other, but in some ways they do relate to one another in, in terms of varying what a human being is. And I think Brett makes the point here quite convincingly that a human being, unlike, unlike you know, uniquely in the world, is, is dependent on this this story verse, this culture verse, in order to be what we recognize as a human being. This now, of course, Hitler's um, the science upon which Hitler based his theories has, in many ways, been undermined um, by the complexity of of genetics, and and we know far more about genetics than than the early Darwinists understood, but. But yet, it's interesting that, again, even in Hitler's view, there's, there's sort of these two tracks going. There's the genetic track, and then there's the story verse track. And, of course, Hitler thought that the story verse track was this, this big distraction that had to be put away with, and you get away with, from that track by getting rid of all of this Jewish contamination to get all of that stuff. But the, the, the continued endurance of these two tracks is, is noteworthy here. So, in one sense... Dawkins introduced this idea with the concept of memes. It became clear in my conversation with him in October, though, that he didn't take the concept of memes very seriously, that he thought that it was loosely analogous 
to the genetic Darwinian process, but it didn't have important consequences. What I would argue to you is that we humans have offloaded a large fraction of the, uh, the adaptive landscape to what I would call the software layer, right? Our genomes do not create a functional creature. We are utterly helpless at birth, and our very long childhoods are a time period in which one can discover and basically self-program the software necessary for life. Now, what we do during that time is we largely pick up the wisdom of our immediate ancestors, who we meet, and then we augment it with things that we discover that they didn't know, which is a very small fraction of what we come to understand. So, if you take that paradigm, what you'll realize is that we get handed a belief system that individuals whose belief system is a better match for the world have advantages people whose belief systems are a poorer match for the world have disadvantages, and over time, those belief systems, the narratives that we hand off, will be refined by this process. And so, this is so certain once you accept that we have these cultural traits and that better ones will inherently be passed on more often than worse ones, it is so certain that effectively we are talking about a tautology. When we talk about, for example, the narratives that go along with the life of Jesus, how is it possible that those narratives were not shaped by the fact that some versions of the story were more compelling, some versions of the story led to alterations in behavior that uh, led populations to outcompete their rivals? These things effectively have to be true. Now, now, getting into the particularities, let's say, of the four synoptic gospels versus, let's say, the, the Gnostic text, so on and so forth, I don't think the time or community of those, uh, of those books necessarily were subjected to a Darwinian evolution. They're, they're, the books, there's just simply not enough time, even in the story verse. I, I think those books, there are other factors involved, but the, the overall picture that, that he's giving us has has some merit and in fact it's a little better clarified in his conversation with with sam harris i think and so therein lies the explanation for all of the belief systems uh, that we find different populations having on earth they are not inherently in competition with each other they are adaptations to different times and different places different obstacles um, sometimes a belief system replaces another. Sometimes we have a process analogous to speciation where you'll get you know, a division, for example, between Catholics and Protestants where both continue on, adapted to slightly different uh, uh, parameters. And so um, my... I was going to say, I mean, I'll, I'll be interested in Alice's response in a moment, but, but what you've described there, in a sense, is, is this idea that religious beliefs like perhaps all beliefs of one kind or another, come, we, we receive them because of their value that has been handed down by the evolutionary process, this, this adaptive sort of, uh, if you like, uh, benefit that it confers on the people who, who hold it together perhaps in a community. But in that sense, it doesn't have much to say as to whether those beliefs are true uh, in, in a kind of objective way. It's more about their, their usefulness in, in that way. Well, I would argue that they're that this is um, not really an obstacle, that in a sense, so what I've defined as something I call metaphorical truth. A metaphorical truth is a belief that if one acts according to the idea that it is true, one outcompetes somebody who will act according to the fact that it is false. Um, so Give an example of, of what that might look like. So in order... I've, I've played this before, and he talks about the... Um, and I think there there's real issues with his idea about metaphorical truth, but... I think he's, you know, I'll leave it at I'll leave it at that. Now, one of the things that I've also been getting into is is Robert Bella's religion in human evolution, which is very interesting because part of the question in here is, well, what is a religion? Um, he, he start Robert Bella starts out talking about um, uh, Dawkins' book, but then goes on to some other definition. Now, again, all of this would be a, a tremendous challenge to 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 Hitler's imagination of what he imagines a human being is um, just doesn't obviously doesn't really square with square with any of this so so Bella talks about Dawkins and and Dawkins again having a rather simplistic idea 
Um, you hear both Jordan Peterson and and Brett Weinstein making the point that Dawkins didn't go far enough with his meme and if he went further, and, and actually Robert Bella gets into this. Most students of evolution continue to believe, contrary to Dawkins, that it is the organism that evolves, not just the genes. Mary Jane West Eberhard emphasizes the role of organism, phenotype, in its own evolution. I consider genes followers, not leaders, in the adaptive evolution. Mark Kirshner and John Gerhardt, in their important book, The Plausibility of Life, develop a, a conception of, of or, organism. Um, or of organismic control of variation. On the side of, of generating pheno, phenotypic variation, we believe the organism indeed participates in its own evolution and does so with a bias related to its long history of variation and selection. Of particular importance are the behavioral and, and symbolic aspects of evolution, which build on genetic capacities, but are themselves not developed, not, not genetically controlled. As it were, what we um, what we will probably find most of the resources, um, as it is there that we will probably find most of the resources for religion, cultural developments from biological beginnings. The evolutionary linguist Derek Bickerton suggests just how far back we must go in finding these beginnings. Speaking of language, but implicitly of culture, he writes, the trouble with almost all previous attempts to look at origins is that they do not go back far enough. If we were to understand thoroughly all the language involved, we would probably have to go back to the birth of the lowliest animate creatures. For language depends cruci um, crucially on the matrix of volition and primitive consciousness, which must have begun um, to be laid down hundreds of millions of years ago. A very suggestive elaboration of the degree to which organisms participate in their own evolution, an important kind of behavioral evolution, has just been offered by John Odling Schmee and his colleagues in their book Nietzsche Construction, The Neglected Process in Evolution. Odling Schmee et al. argue that we cannot understand evolution unless we see how actively organisms create the conditions for their own evolution. Natural selection is indeed blind, and yet paradoxically, it leads to purposive action. If natural selection is blind, yet niche, that yet niche construction is semantically informed and goal-directed, then evolution must comprise an entirely purposeless process. Um, must comprise an entirely purposeless process, namely natural selection, selecting for purposive organisms namely niche constructing organisms. This must be true at least insofar as the niche constructing organisms that are selected by natural selection function so as to survive and reproduce. In other words, you know, purpose gets into the equation. Now he developed the, develops this a little bit further and again in some ways talks about this alternative snack, uh, alternative snack, am I hungry? No, alternative track. I hope this gives some idea of what I mean by evolution and why I think it's important if we are to understand who we are and where we might want to go. But what I do mean by religion and what is and what is an evolution of religion. Religion is a complex phenomenon not easily defined and although I spend much of the first two chapters trying to define it just to get to the things I will I start to draw on Clifford Geertz's well-known definition paraphrasing him religion is a system of symbols that when enacted by human beings establish powerful pervasive and long-lasting moods and motivations that make sense in terms of an idea of a general order of existence it is interesting to note that Geertz left out, there's no mention of belief in supernatural beings or belief in God or gods, which, which many current definitions take for granted as essential. It is not that Geertz or I think such beliefs are absent in religion, though in some cases there may be, just that they are not a defining aspect. And then he'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, that's probably what I'll read. Um... I'll read in here. Let me let me just pull back and look at the larger argument. Again, we began by talking about the question: Is secular humanism is secular humanism more fragile than Christianity? 
The reason I'm going into the Brett Weinstein, religion, Robert Bella stuff is because my assertion is that the religion here is foundational. The religion here is much more durable. The religion here is something essential to human beings. This is very much contra Hitler. For Hitler, again, it's just the, it's just the genetics. Hitler did not understand what a human being was in that sense. Hitler believed that, well, human beings will struggle and kill and reproduce, and he only imagined sort of the genetic layer. He didn't understand that, in fact, it's this other layer that very much makes us human beings. Religion, in fact, is how we survive. In fact, religion is why we survive. Religion has been the primary culture lane for human survival. The Pinker Tribe Enlightenment argument is a subtle redefinition of what it means to be human and, in fact, what the good life is. Hitler had an understanding of good life in very basic genetic terms. We, in fact, have to live in a religious landscape. And my question is whether this humanism religious light can really be durable. Now, if you read something like Yuval Noah, Noah Harari, his, his brief history, I don't know if he's got a new book out since now, but uh, his brief history of tomorrow, he imagines that, well, humanity is going to continue on this culture track and then continue to impose itself on the genetic track. That might be. But what we can see now is well, we can get a sense of, of some of the, the things ahead that we're not quite sure how this is going to monkey with human beings as what we are. We're dealing with what we mean by a human being. What is the good life? What makes it good? Um, will you find these ideas in science? Now, I found another video on the on this website from this from this Jewish organization and it talks about the outbreak of World War II, Jewish families on the brink of war. I found this portrayal rather interesting for um, something that I want to note here. In 1939, Jews enjoyed a vibrant, diverse, rich and active life throughout Europe vibrant, diverse, rich. And now we're using very much contemporary religious terms, terms that are just simply assumed by us to sort of be, well, this is what life is about. Now, now pay attention here because we're not going to, we're not going to go where Hitler did in terms of, well, we're going to be working on the species, but there's another track which has come online that says, well, this is what life is about. Life is about pleasant experiences. It's sort of an Epicurean value system. They raised families, ran their businesses, dreamed and planned, loved and grieved. Now, now again, notice this is, they, they lived their lives, dreamed and planned, loved and breathed. All of these are, are deeply psychological terms. Now, now again, you know, we want, we want to get, I mean, John in his thing wants to get beyond the Axial Age mythology, but these, these dualisms keep popping up. And it's very interesting that we continue, what, what we've sort of had now where you have Hitler with sort of this, um, this brute, ecological argument about good, we now very much have this psychological argument about good. And, and we don't hear people making this case, but well, why should we, for example, um, end the life of, of either preborns or newborns with developmental problems? Well, because they can't achieve the greatest good. Well, what is the greatest good? Well, it's this sort of this psychological well-being. And, and so every time we hear Dillahunty or Sam Harris talk about well-being, it would be good to push that a little bit more because, again, most of this is, is psychological. We, we've, in a sense, gone beyond Hitler, but, but now we've sort of, again, 
occupied the upper half of the second story of of humanity that that has two stories uh, and you know there's a good bit of romanticism that that seems to be sneaking in here now one of the, one again one of the interesting things that my question here is well is is secular humanism more fragile than christianity and i'm going to argue that by the evidence it seems to be because what we do it seems very clear is not jordan peterson made this point very often once you sort of get rid of a bunch of the story stuff out here up here that that sam harris finds problematic well then people are supposed to be rational but i keep bringing up countless countless examples of how they're not and well, let's let's listen to this video just dropped and Julian posted it on the Discord, and there's tons of good stuff in this video. It just dropped today. Or I just found it today. So I want to start with um, an anecdote uh, about... This is Tara Isabel Burton. ...about a, um, a hair salon and spa in New York. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what was once um, the Red Door, the Elizabeth Arden um, salon. Um, in the sort of American mid-century and thereafter, it was associated with a very particular brand of elegance, of glamour, of exclusivity. To go behind the red door was to uh, attain a certain social status uh, and glamour. Um, the red door is rebranded last... Now, now, now what, is it, what is natural for human beings to do in a case like this? Well, status. Well, we will pay more for status, even just to get our hair done. Um, last year, it's now called Mind, N-Y-N-D Spa. It is now a self-care journey with the same perks as its upscale predecessor. Um, it's a um, slogan is, no matter how you define self-care, Mind is a resource helping on, you, focused on helping you achieve lasting beauty and wellness. Um, at Mind, you'll find self-care you can confidently say is my. It's a... Uh, my, not mine. It, it, that's just what it says. Um, <laughs> and I find this absolutely fascinating as a, an illustrative example that the, where you go for your kind of high-end um, investment in yourself, uh, to use the sort of contemporary parlance, is, is not the place that advertises wealth or a particular vision of glamour, but a kind of spiritualized notion of, of, of wellness, um, of... Of a, it's a journey now to go and, and get your hair done. It is, I've, I've actually been there. You really just get your hair done. There's nothing different. It's, it's the same as anywhere in the salon. Um, but the, uh, the narrative around it, what it advertises, is, is quite different. And to me, this speaks to uh, a wider point, or, or the first point I want to make, which is the way in which um, sort of spirituality has become a very particular kind of commodity. It has become aspirational. It has become... Um, now, towards the end of John Verveke's, um, I always talk about the se the the, um, the the secret sacred self. John very much talked about the um, the sacred second self, or was it the secret second self? I think it's the sacred second self, um, but the second self. And I, th I found that those very interesting conversations. And I'm going to talk to John a little bit later in the month. Maybe we'll talk about that. It's fascinating stuff. Um easily treatable. It has become something that you can um, basically go into a store or go on Amazon and buy. Um, and one might, you know, you can take two uh, approaches to this. You can say, well, this is completely terrible and this is just a uh, horrible uh, truth of late capitalism, which is not wrong. But it is also true that the fact that this is the, the hottest commodity in town, the sense of, of wellness, of spiritual well-being, of having a journey that that you can sell products with this, I think speaks to a very particular American spiritual hunger. So, <laughs> excuse me, according to um, a 2018 study by um, the branding arm of the media company Vice, it's called Virtue, that is true. 54% um, of millennials said that they were um, eager to spend their money on brands that, quote, enhanced their spirit and soul 77% say they um, seek out brands that share their values. Um, so, and again, these are just these are just millennials that are that are being pulled here. But there is very much a sense among, uh, let's say, 
all Americans, but I would say particularly uh, millennials and uh, Generation Z, that a kind of uh, moral, spiritual, communal hunger, and, I, and these, these words are not synonymous, but there's certainly overlap, is, uh, is how people decide where to spend their money. Um, this is coming, of course, at the same time that we are seeing uh, more and more Americans, again, particularly millennials and Generation Z, identify as religiously unaffiliated. Uh, so that's 36% of uh, young millennials and uh, around the same number of Generation Z say they do not belong to any uh, religious tradition. However, and this is extremely important, um, and this is of all the religiously unaffiliated America, 72% still say they believe in God or a higher power and about 20% say they believe in the Judeo-Christian God. Um, so about um, 20 again, 20% of the religiously unaffiliated are say they don't want to check the Christian box or the Jewish box, but they still say that they believe in the God of the Bible. Now, it's worth saying that some often atheists and agnostics do tend to uh, self-underreport. So it is the 72% might be a, a tad lower. There may be people who say, I believe in something, but don't identify. Uh, but may not personally, uh, privately feel that way. But even so, I think it's an extremely striking figure that there is just an enormous um, number, there are, there's an enormous number of Americans who believe in something and care about something and want to spend their money on accessing that something. Um, but for whatever reason, or for reasons which I will talk about, um, do not wish or feel that they can do so through the medium of organized religion. And um, for me, at least in, in, my, in my book, and my read on this is that so much of this tension has less to do with, with personal faith, with personal belief, than it does with a mounting distrust in institutions more broadly and um, visions of what, um, what one's spiritual life ought to be. Um, my hypothesis, and I'd sort of love to sort of debate and discuss and see where we, uh, where we align and where we don't here, is that um, the, the tension isn't exactly between, maybe Christianity and paganism aren't the words I would use to describe it, but between a kind of intuitionalism and institutionalism, that in the American religious landscape, there is a, a spiritual trend that you can find, and I, I see it reflected in, in wellness, in modern occultism, in techno-utopianism in fandom culture and all of these uh, in the rise of um, the cultures around polyamory, for example, um, a, a profound belief in the power of, of human individuality, of human intuition to rewrite the script, to remake our own worlds. Um, there's a kind of, I believe, a, a unified theology you can find in these many disparate traditions um, that are popular with what you might call the spiritual but not religious and what I call um, the, the religiously remixed, which is a combination of people who identify as um, spiritual but not religious, people who say they believe in a higher power but don't affiliate um, with the religion, and people who um, say they belong to one religion but uh, whose practices are much more eclectic. Uh, just one example, about 29% uh, of uh, self-repressed Christians say they believe in reincarnation. So what do we, what do, we do with that? And all of these, um, these groups together, I, I call the, the remixed. Um, and I, I would motion that what unites all these different groups and all these practices um, popular with this group is this, this sort of idea that there, there's the self and there's society, and that the self is fundamentally good, fundamentally divine, its intuitions are fundamentally right, your desires are fundamentally pure, and a, a repressive society. Um... Now, now, now notice again how, how these things have morphed, how these things have changed. And, and notice the level at which they change. This isn't structure, this isn't organized. In fact, it, it's anti-institutional at this moment, but this isn't, you know, this isn't people shucking off Christianity and getting getting rational this is people shucking off christianity because they're more intuitive or or um sort of a repressive culture in some way uh, gets between you and your truest self 
and that the, your duty as a, as a person who wants to achieve self-actualization through self-care is to um, look inward to figure out who you really are and to cast off these oppressive shackles. Now, this isn't necessarily and, and isn't at all a, a new idea in American religious life. Um, it's, um, for, for starters, sort of the idea that um, we're all into astrology now or we're all into occultism now is, is um, somewhat um, inaccurate. Um, in the late 17th century and um, the early, um, throughout and the 18th century, for example, only about 15% of Americans actually um, went to church. Um, practices like divination, fortune telling, astrology, folk medicine, wordscraft, all quite common. So this isn't completely new. Um, but also there's a, just a strong um, and robust American tradition of this kind of intuitional focus. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of transcendentalism, of Emerson, who uh, condemned human society as a conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members, a joint stock company in which the members agree to surrender the liberty and culture of uh, the joiner. Um, there's, uh, for those of you familiar with New Thought, which was um, extremely popular, it's this massive craze in the 19th century. It's basically, if you're familiar with The, the Secret, uh, it's basically that, but in the 19th century, started in the um, 1860s and um, by a clockmaker called Phineas Quimby and became this just massive best-selling publication craze where the idea was you can manifest your own reality simply by believing in yourself, simply by uh, dreaming it and it would arrive. Um, a, a couple of wonderful sort of self-help quotes from New Thought authors. Um, you're, you're meant to um, repeat, I am well, I am opulent, I have everything, I do right, I know, uh, and then this would happen to you. Um, anything if you use yours, if you want only want it hard enough, just think of it, anything, try it, try it in earnest and you will succeed. It is the operation of a mighty law that was William Walter Atkinson's 1901 thought force in business and everyday life. Um, so there is, there is a sort of long-standing American tradition of this belief in both a kind of pure individualism, but also a spiritualized individualism. Now, I think part of what we should be seeing here is how human beings are, okay? And, you know, there's clearly something motivated behind Hitler's imagination that, well, the Germans are up on top, and of course he's Austrian, but considers himself German, his language groups perhaps, or he imagines his races to be. So the, the German language groups are up on top, and the Jews are sort of a non-race or an anti-race, because otherwise, well, they, Hitler might be second. They're, human beings are, are tremendously motivated, and the, the sphere in, in which this motivation occurs is not so much down here the genetic the matter verse, but it's up here in the story verse. And, and this is what gets into our, as Bella notes, this is what for a very long time gets into our evolution, gets into our transformation. And again, if, if, if Holland's thesis is correct, you know, Christianity so dominated all of this that, that so many of sort of the, the fixed points had been set by Christianity, especially with respect to, to moral aspirations. Now, and, and what happens is there, there's always this process of, of sort of, you know, finding these pillars and then settling back into sort of the, the, the average succumbing to, to our desires. And this might, you know, get into some of this magical thinking. And, and it's so ironic that you know, all of this attacking, well, institutional religion because you can sort of find them easily because they're actually getting in one place and they're forming institutions and they're propagating and maintaining themselves through time as opposed to all of this other stuff which seems to always be in the background. One in which by, by listening to yourself you can affect the force, the energy of the universe. And often this language of a kind of depersonalized nebulous energy was as common in um, the new thought as it, as it is now. Um, but there um, are, I would motion, distinctive elements of contemporary um, intuitionalist culture that make it uh, rather different and, uh, for my mind, even more interesting to write about uh, than uh, its forebears. There's the, uh, the internet, of course, and the uh, idea that we are all sort of curating our own identities. We can mix and match. We don't have to um, 
It's a phenomenon that the Harvard Divinity Scholar um, Casper Turcoila mm -hmm. and Angie Thurston call um, unbundling, kind of like a cable package. You can, you can mix and match, you can get your, your, your sense of meaning from one place and your purpose from the other place, and, and you can do a bit of yoga and a bit of tarot, um, and a, go to Christmas and Easter services, but also your friendship at dinner, and that the way in which you create your spiritual life, um, I, someone I interviewed, Phil Zuckerman, who wrote a, book, a wonderful book on secularism, said, well, you curate your Facebook feed. Why shouldn't you curate your, curate your spiritual life? And I thought, that, well, make of that what you will. Um, uh, there's a, there now exists um, something called the Ritual Design Lab, which is founded by um, uh, designers uh, Chrisette Ozench and uh, Margaret Hagen, who, um, which basically, if you tell the lab um, what you need or want, they do this for per, uh, people. They also do it for companies. They've used, um, Microsoft has used them. Uh, they will create rituals for you to uh, enact, to somehow, I don't know, maximize your spiritual potential. Um, and this, this, was, this is um, how they describe themselves. Um, the new generation wants bite-sized spirituality instead of a whole menu of courses. Um, frame this as a good thing. Um, so the way in which the internet culture um, of this kind of curation culture, the, the freedom that we have not just to mix and match, but also to create, to um, respond to um, an existing text or an existing idea, not simply with acquiescence, but with a, a sense of entitlement that we should be able to tell our own stories. All of this has, I believe, resulted in uh, a spiritual landscape defined by a kind of obsession on the part of many uh, believers and would-be believers with, with, with agency, with creative ownership, with, you might say, control. Um, you can, um, I'm just going to skip ahead because I realize that I'm going on a bit. Um, and I think the, the last point that I, I do want to make um, before I wrap up is that um, it's, it's possible to be a, a bit cynical and, and roll one's eyes at this, and I, I certainly have been guilty of doing that a bit in the talk. However, it's also vital to, to mention that for many people, this is the only access to a, a spiritual life that they feel they have. People who perceive that they have been um, marginalized or left behind or mistreated or abandoned by their um, faith community or... Now, now notice again, now, now we're introducing the, the assumed moral view of this group of people. And again, as Tom Holland would note, classics, you know, people in the people in antiquity wouldn't see it this way. This 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 perspective on this group of people, the we had rather a haughty view of all of these silly people and their 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 buffet spirituality. And well, now we're going to remember that these these people are deserving of, of mercy and pity. And well, I'll get insert Christianity into that posture. Or in which they were raised. Um, iterations of spirituality that um, either are apart from or consciously, as in the case of elements of modern paganism, um, stand against uh, the Judeo-Christian cultural tradition are seen as sort of desirable um, and even acts of political resistance. Um, I'm going to, to just close with a, a quote from a, a zine uh, by uh, Dakota Stockfleet, who is a uh, non-binary witch at Catlan Books, which was behind the um, Hex uh, Brett Kavanaugh event uh, in uh, 2018. And there's a zine called The, the Ethics of Cursing that I, that I bought in Catlan, which talks about how black magic is um, is for them a very necessary element of fighting against oppression. Uh, they code, uh, code oppression as both Christianity, colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy. Cursing becomes not just something you kind of do for fun or as a fun witch aesthetic, but a, a way of um, reclaiming a spiritual life in conscious political opposition. Um, if you practice witchcraft, they write, and you have never considered cursing someone, I have to assume you haven't been through much in the way of violence, trauma, or abuse. Folk magic is what arms the poor, the downtrodden, and the outcast. How could anyone fault me for cursing my rapist? Even if I was to subject myself to the terrifying police, the exhaustion of telling and retelling and retelling the story of how I was attacked and robbed and violated to people who will blame me or not believe me, um, there is almost a surefire guarantee he will not be caught or brought to justice. How could anyone blame me, let alone shame me, for seeking to be the arbiter of my own justice 
by cursing that evil made. Notice the grabbing of the story, the molding of the story, and always, you know, the connection between the the matter verse and the story verse and how well I am going to change I am going to change the matter verse by way of the story verse even if the details don't change even if the history doesn't change I am going to take it and 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 this is all part of the agency of the self in pulling this off now the next talk is is excellent too and I'll stop there be here uh, this distinguished company to talk about some pretty interesting questions, I think. In my remarks, I'm going to try to do a couple of things. Uh, one is, as Ross uh, asked me to do, to give a bit of a sense of the argument in the book that he mentioned, Pagans and Christians in the City. But then I also want to uh, offer a few thoughts, speculative thoughts, on the significance of that argument for the question that's uh, most central, I guess, to our discussion. Do this is Stephen Smith from uh, San Diego School of Law. We have, or on are we on the verge of settling into some new American religion that would be post-Christian, maybe describable as some kind of paganism, but something that would serve the role that maybe non-sectarian Protestantism did in the 19th century? And, and again, the, we, we've seen this in many people, this search for a, a new religion that isn't a religion, or you know, Alistair, Mc, Alistair McGrath noting to Brett Weinstein, it almost sounds like you're wanting to start a new religion. And, and this again, you remember Tom Holland making the comment that um, you know we're we're sort of we're sort of post-Protestantism and and Steve Smith very much following up on the the same line of thought here in this video. So in the book, uh, I try to develop and defend an idea that was proposed by T. S. Eliot. Uh, Eliot argued at one point that the future of the West would be determined by a contest between Christianity and what he called modern paganism. He thought Western societies are currently Christian or classifiable as Christian, not because they're Christian in any very deep sense, but because they once had been Christian, and sort of by default they would remain classifiable as Christian. Now, now, now don't forget here what Tara had said too, that remember in the 19th century, church attendance was perhaps something around the you know 15% of the American population, which is in fact lower than it is now. And I've made the point a number of times that church attendance reached its peak in American society during the Cold War. So there, there's often this mythology, the subtraction story that everybody used to go to church back in the old days and then in the 20th century it's sort of been constantly going down. That's that's by no means the truth. And what Stephen Smith is going to do is, is, is make this whole picture quite a bit more complex. Until that was replaced by, I think he said positively something else, which he thought had not happened yet. But maybe it has happened by now. Uh, they, not because point. they're Christian in any very deep sense, but because they once had been Christian, and sort of by default they would remain classifiable as Christian, until that was replaced by, I think he said positively something else, which he thought had not happened yet. But maybe it has happened by now. Uh, maybe the modern paganism that he mentioned has now prevailed. Um, and that would at least be another way of raising the question that Ross raises here, I think. Now, Eliot offered this suggestion. He said, as a help with, he said, immediate perplexities that fill our minds. He said, the current terms in which we describe our society only operate to deceive and stupefy us. And that seems right to me. And so uh, that, that seemed like it was an intriguing possibility to investigate and see whether his diagnosis would help with that. In particular, it does seem that the prophecies that were once almost universally believed about inevitable secularization have by now been pretty much discredited or at least heavily qualified. But we still tend to describe constituencies or movements or positions by putting them into the boxes of religious or secular. And yet these descriptions often seem to obscure as much as they illuminate. On many issues, the parties on both sides of a controversy seem religious. They reflect a kind of evangelical zeal, a sort of good versus evil view of the world, a tendency to want to anathematize their opponents. Um, secular and Christian doesn't quite seem to capture that. It seems to, uh, so over a century ago, Chesterton uh, said, uh, what we see in the world is, a, quote, a fight of creeds masquerading as policies. And he went on to say, we've, we've contrived to invent a new kind of hypocrite. The old hypocrite was a man whose aims were really worldly and practical, while he pretended that they were religious. The new hypocrite is one who aims, whose aims are really religious while he pretends that they are worldly and practical. 
Uh, that seems to me, if anything, more true today than it was when Chesterton wrote it. But the question is, you know, how to describe these religious divides. And Eliot's diagnosis, it seemed, might be helpful in doing this. Now, that diagnosis, I think, generates a major objection. And that is that paganism just doesn't seem to be a term that describes, you know, important positions or movements today. It, and, and again, I, I thought it was really helpful in... Uh, Weikart's book where he notes, was, was Hitler a Christian? No. Was Hitler an atheist? No. Was Hitler an occultist or, you know, an occultist? No. Well, how, how do we categorize? And, and in fact, what, what you'll note here is that we even have difficulty categorizing ourselves because what's interesting is that in this particular setting, even though there's a heavy religious background to it, it's also deeply secular at the same time that these these layers are coexisting and in fact these layers are always coexisting and and as I wanted to say before the you, we would expect from this group of people to be both highly secularized highly educated and at the top of the class game and and if what is true for these people the people going to red this 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 uber um, exclusive salon where, you know, yeah, you're getting your hair done, but it's a spiritual experience and it's a spiritual upgrade and, and your hair is infused with spirituality. It, these, are, these are people that we would imagine, th these would people that Sam Harris would imagine, well, these people should all be rational and non-religious. And what, again, we find is, as Stephen Smith said, that thesis is dead. It's gone. I mean, it's not, it's not even taking seriously this, this rationalistic eschatology. There's no evidence for it, and it's, it simply should be put away. It is true. There, we hear more about Wiccans and Satanists and, and so forth, and these are interesting uh, movements and so forth, but not really politically and culturally salient. And, and, and so we notice, well, we got kind of Christianity lurking around here, and we got secularism and secular-ish kind of all over, and then we have the, have the spiritual all over, but they don't, they don't coalesce. They don't, I, I really like the, the institutional versus intuitional, because institutional, you know, we're always talking about these propositions. Institutions and communities need propositions to sort of find each other and, and, and locate each other and hold each other accountable and have a structure, whereas the intuitional, where they're all over the place, but they'll never become a community, and so they just sort of... Um, they sort of gig their way to a community. I need a little community here. I need a little meaning here. And so they're just kind of, you know, doing the salad bar thing and piecing it together and uh, fill their plate and say, oh, there it is. Well, at least politically, let's say, uh, actors, it seems, uh, especially in the academy where I live. Uh, my progressive friends in the academy who have managed to read the book um, find the description <laughs> of some of them as pagans as just either amusing or insulting, but just not plausible at all. Um, now, my response to that objection is to suggest that uh, they're right in rejecting this if you equate paganism with myths about Zeus and Apollo and so forth, or with sacrifices and auguries and, and, and that sort of thing. But I think it's more helpful and really, in a sense, more perspicuous, let's say, to uh, understand paganism as imminent religiosity. Uh, put it this way, you know. Uh, imminent religiosity, it's really good. If religion, which of course is a much disputed term, is taken to refer to an orientation toward the sacred, then we can act again. That's that's far closer to um, you know to something Robert Bella would be pursuing in his book, an orientation to the sacred or um, you know the, the item of our chief concern. You know, again, much more of a sociology of religious, a, a functional definition of religion rather than stories about supernatural things ask for somebody what is the sacred for them or more specifically where is the sacred and the pagan answer is the sacred exists within this world um, it's imminent uh, it's an imminent religiosity now I don't think that in defining paganism this way there's anything really contrived about the definition either um, basically that's I think the same conceptions used in the really remarkable recent book by Anthony Cronman confessions of a born-again pagan uh, but it's also, I think, really faithful to ancient paganism. Uh, in the first century BC, the scholar Marcus Varro distinguished among mythic religion, basically stories about gods and goddesses and so forth, civic religion, the sacrifices and auguries and so forth, 
and we might say, use the term philosophical religion. And it was possible, he said, to scoff at the mythic religion, as Varro and many others did, even perhaps at the civic religion, as Seneca did, at least according to Augustine, and still embrace the philosophical religion, then treating the stories about gods and goddesses and the sacrifices and so forth as kind of symbolic or expressive manifestations of this deeper, you know, imminent religiosity. This probably was actually the position of many educated Romans at the time. Now, in this context, the rise of Christianity and Judaism was a radical development. Uh, scholars like Jan Osman have explained precisely because Christians and Jews believed in a transcendent deity. And, and uh, you know, I've been, you know, picked up in, in my habit of reading too many books at once, kind of looking at these two books at the same time. Um, the Religion of Israel, which this is the um, Moshe Greenberg's translation of Ezekiel Kaufman, and the Transubstantiation book, especially the first chapter, very much getting into nominalism versus realism and, and the, the debate over transubstantiation. And this is going to go into the, you know, why, you know, why Luther wanted to resist nominalism and the problems that he had with transubstantiation and on and on. So, so this question of of the radical re, reworking of the playing field that happened um, with Judaism and Christianity. And this belief had revolutionary implications for views of the world, sexuality, civic obligation, and life generally. Now, as we know, in the fourth and fifth centuries, there was a kind of on again, off again struggle between Christianity and paganism within the Roman Empire, and Christianity eventually prevailed as an official matter, but that's an important qualifier. Uh, this is sometimes described as the Christian Revolution, and of course it set the stage for centuries of Christendom and so forth. And yet I think it would be a mistake to think that paganism simply disappeared. In fact, I, I would say it survived and even flourished in various ways, uh, but I'll mention three. Uh, one is I think paganism persisted and indeed was cherished in the sort of historical memory of the West. Uh, there was a long-standing, you know, ongoing admiration for and a desire to recover the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome, to use a pose phrase. Uh, the Renaissance, of course, was a sort of emphatic manifestation of this theme, and that theme is easily observable in a lot of the paintings of the great Renaissance masters. Uh, secondly, and kind of conversely, in the Western imagination, I think there's been a persistent resentment towards, often hostility toward, the force that turned out the lights on, as Heinrich Heine put it, the merry dance of paganism, namely Christianity, a resentment toward Christianity. That's been an ongoing theme too, but the Enlightenment is often you know, seen as a conspicuous manifestation of that theme. In Peter Gay's admired history of the Enlightenment, he emphasizes this anti-Christian theme and describes the Enlightenment as the rise of modern paganism. That's his subtitle for one of his volumes. Um, but third, and perhaps even more importantly, I think it can plausibly be argued that paganism, or a tendency to sacralize the things of this world, is in a sense the natural condition of humanity. You know, we live in this world, this is the world we know firsthand, that we're sure of. Anything beyond this world we know only through intimation or inference. And insofar as we are oriented toward the sacred, we naturally tend to locate the sacred within this world. This is and, and again, th this gets into very deep things, a sacramental view of the world, um, that I mean, there's a ton of stuff in his little talk here. It's actually a pretty familiar point. It's been stressed in scripture and a thousand homilies over the centuries by, by preachers and, and so forth. Um, so I think it actually might plausibly be argued that despite the official triumph of Christianity in late antiquity, paganism actually remained a sort of dominant position or orientation throughout the, the intervening centuries. But even so, and this is important too, over those centuries, Chris, uh, centuries of Christendom, basically, uh, Christianity has remained sort of the official position. It's supplied the regulative ideal for, for governing law and politics and culture and so forth. Paganism, I would argue, has remained strong, but mostly beneath the surface, um, you know, uh, not, not, uh, not the official position. And, and this is where, again, I, I make the observations about class that you know, everybody on this stage is doing very well. And they are highly educated. They are the elites. Now, if you get down to, you know, the homeless guy that just came in and we had a little talk and, um, you know, 
I, I never meet homeless people that are that are atheists. They, they all believe in something, and they're very willing to talk about it. And they, me as a preacher, I'm fair game, and off we go, and off we go. And working class people, and you know, people with less education, and people who have not been secularized as much in terms of the habits of of demythologizing of the world. Um, so if you're looking at bulk population, again, the people on the stage should be the most, the most rational in Sam Harris terms, the most demythologized, but you know, these people aren't. And so, and again, people at that elite level, they're, they're the, you know, the Sam Harris talks about, you know, people who are anti-vaxxers. Well, you know, there's plenty of anti-vaxxers in Hollywood in Southern California who have oodles of money and oodles of status and, and plenty of education and they're anti-vaxxers. And so, you know, again, I, I love this, this image that, yeah, Christianity continued to move through, but beneath there are folk religions and it, it's just simply how we're made. And, and so, obviously, you're going to want a religion that plays at the folk level, but plays with the elites. And, again, if you read C.S. Lewis's A Severe Mercy, when C.S. Lewis, in the end, was sort of looking at Hinduism and looking at Christianity after he'd become some kind of a theist, he, he eventually sort of opted for Christianity because he said it, it just simply holds together better, both at the at the at the heights of the intellectual and then down into the 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 lay person with the squeaky boots attending church um singing those silly songs that c.s lewis never liked much church music but this may be where i think things have changed recently uh, i argue in the book that imminent religiosity is becoming more self-conscious and aggressive uh you can see this in various places I, in the book i particularly dis discussed the work of ronald dworkin uh, especially his last book, Religion Without God, but it's apparent in other ways as well. And if that's right, then it wouldn't be surprising to see a more deliberate effort to throw off the vestiges of Christianity as the regulative ideal. And I argue in the book that this, in fact, is what we see in recent decades. Uh, I, do, I teach constitutional law sometimes and write about it, so I talk about this in the area of constitutional law, and I think it helps to illuminate it, uh, developments in the area of new constitutional rights, reflecting the sexual revolution, things concerned with marriage, also in the area of religious freedom. And this can be described, I think, as a kind of pagan counter-revolution, as an attempt to reverse the Christian revolution of late antiquity. Now that discussion in the book takes up two or three chapters, and I won't try to summarize those here. But instead, I want to turn now briefly to uh, the question that we're talking about on this panel. Do we see now the emergence of a new American religion? It's paganism as a sort of regulative ideal replacing Christianity or biblical religion, Judeo-Christianity, as the regulative ideal. Uh, and uh, I think it can only be tentative in addressing that question, but my answer would be yes and no. Um, in, one <laughs> sense, in one sense, more yes than no, and in another sense, more no than yes. So let me just sort of... <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, these academics. i try to explain the, the yes part. I, can, I think it's plausible to say that an imminent religiosity has been the dominant, if tacit, orthodoxy for some time now. It's driven constitutional developments, as I say, uh, and a lot else. I think it's dominant in the academy. I think it's dominant in the entertainment uh, industry. This is not so much a prediction of what may be coming as a sort of fait accompli. But on the no side, I think that paganism or imminent religion may flourish best when it stays beneath the surface. It may be parasitic on something else. Um, when it's camouflaged, there's secular neutrality or a kind of reverent scientific naturalism, or maybe it's a kind of liberal Christianity, though that's a chapter I didn't put in the book, but uh, you know, it's a chapter that could have been written. Now, that is such, what he says right there is just such an interesting idea that you know all of these, both the, the Wiccans over here and Sam Harris over there and, and, and you know, you see this that and liberal Christianity, none of them can sort of exist on their own. They have to feed off something that has more definition, something that has more substance, something that has deeper historical roots, something that has more enduring power. And, and so then they can sort of maintain themselves in a parasitic way at the, at the expense of the host. But, but if the host were to die, uh, it, it's really difficult to know how the civilization could actually have enough to go on and actually be productive and go someplace, which of course 
leads to, you know, real concerns. What if the host dies? You know, we've, we've certainly seen diminishment of the force of Christianity in the culture. What if, what if Christianity goes away from the culture? And, and what we see in the, the Nazi illustration or the communist illustration, that sort of a central, a, a, a different central ideology attempts to function as religion, but very much in the Jordan Peterson mode, it, it's a crippled religion and you know, it, it won't be able to sustain life over the long run. Um, and uh, when paganism comes, or eminent religiosity, comes out in the open as its own thing, then it may need to defend and justify itself. And that's not clear to me that it can do that convincingly. It, maybe it is just too spiritually and intellectually thin to flourish, you know, wh when it's actually viewed, uh, viewed for what it is. Now, Ross, in a column a while back in the New York Times, raised questions about whether modern paganism would have the cultic resources that uh, uh, a successful religion would need. And I think that is a good question. But I want to just quickly point to several other deficiencies, all of which are very debatable. But one, I think that as a philosophical position, the paganism, he doesn't call it that, but he calls it religion, of somebody like Ronald Dworkin, just lacks the coherence and the rigor that either a hardcore scientific naturalism has or that Christianity has. Um, Dworkin, he asserts, basically, that we believe in objective value, not merely subjective value, an objective meaning to life, not merely subjective. But it isn't really clear what these things even mean or what ontological, ontological foundation they have for him. Uh, Anthony Cronman's paganism, which is basically Spinoza, is a whole different story, and I don't have the time or, or re frankly, the competence to talk about that here. But, but I think this is, that is one issue. A second concern, I think, is that the normative attractiveness of modern paganism uh, consists in commitments to things like human equality and human dignity, but these are basically inherited, I would argue, from the Christian or Judeo-Christian, the biblical sort of... Same, same point that Tom Holland is making. Tradition, and it's not clear that they're sustainable, you know, if they're removed from that sort of foundation. In other words, again, it's a, it's a, there's a parasitic nature to that, to their existence that, well, they can derive these things from, you know, if the, if, if Christianity is there to derive them from, but what happens when Christianity is, let's say, either actively toppled over, like we see in Nazism or communism, or, or just simply sort of erodes. And, and in some ways, perhaps, you know, watching Europe is going to be the, the, the way to get a sense of, of which way that blows. Um, just a third sort of final point here. Um, I think modern imminent religiosity is primarily committed to secondary values, you might say, to things like human equality and dignity and autonomy. The goal, in other words, is sort of to enable human beings to live the kind of life that they choose or that we choose. But paganism doesn't have much to say about what to choose, you know, about what kind of life really is valuable. Walter Lippmann talked about this uh, years ago in a really important book, I think, uh, written in the 1920s, A Preface to Morals. And then he says, you know, um, here's a quote, having won the freedom to do what they wish, modern people, they do not know what they wish to do. You know, he said, uh, th this, uh, these sort of secondary values don't really tell us what a good life consists of. So as I said, I think there is a lot to debate here uh, and a lot that's speculative. But these kinds of considerations lead me to be skeptical about whether there's a new American religion in the sense of an imminent religiosity or paganism that we could really settle into. You know, and I, I sort of think it's more likely that we're going to have an ongoing, continuing conflict and confusion over some of these things. So, again, excellent talk, and, and, and watch, the, watch the whole talk. You know, and, and as I as the point I made a few times, you know, class is a big deal in this discussion, and it's not really talked about at all. And and the conversation of the the most secular class you've got here, um, we're not talking about ethnic minority communities. We're not talking about immigrant communities. We're not talking about blue class blue blue collar working class communities. All less subject to the scientific peer pressure. Now now the thought towards um, the end of this. So they, they both give their little spiel and the thought kind of pushes in and then they'll have question and answer. And again, the whole, the whole video is worth wa watching, but I wanted to sort of wrap it up, connecting it to, I think I'm going to split this into two parts, the first part and the second part. So I've got to do some little connectors because I think the whole video is going to be too long, even for me. 
So I'll release part one on one day and part one on another day. Yeah, give you a little, give you a little teaser out there, but that means I got to do some little connecting bits for it. But, but do thought then to sort of tie this up and bring it back to the, the Nazi question, which you know then I then I have to bring it back to the the whole question to bring it back to the Nazi question. Do thought kind of ask kind of goes there and asks about that with them. It's it's quite interesting. He makes a good point. The and but it but since that ended where it ended right in national socialism and everything associated with that, I wonder if there's sort of a permanent, maybe not permanent, but there's I think there's a clear desire in some quarters to move beyond Christianity, but never move beyond Christianity in that way again. And and I think you know when you get all the way back to Matt Dillahunty and people like him, that's pretty much where they're at. So let's sort of stay parasitic, even if we're not really going to footnote it or we're not really going to care or we just say okay, if it's arbitrary that we say human exceptionalism. But let's just let's just stay right here. Let's let's stay right here and not move. But again, I think the argument is that. They're tethered to something much larger, and and they're 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 not only a sort of living parasitically off the host, but they're they're actually attempting to kill the host. And now now many others, such as let's say Adam Adam Friended Think Club, um, he's he's very he, he's much more. No, I like Christians, and I'm glad the church is here, and I like Christianity, and I like their morals. I don't believe in their God, but I certainly want them to stick around. And, and I think there's a good number of people like that too, and and sort of unlike the, well, you know, Sam Harris and 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 Matt Delahunty are sort of you know deriving their de deriving their income by eating and feeding on the host, trying to get there. But they you know, they 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 don't want it to go beyond. They don't you know they, they don't want they don't want communism and they don't want. They don't want Nazi ideology either. They 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 sort of want the status quo, even though they're preaching a sort of utopian eschatology of rationalism and godlessness. That it can all be better if we get rid of the god. Do you think where sort of I mean you you've you've written about sort of Nietzschean mm. sort of flirtations and forays, and those are often on the alt right or, or the far right. But I mean, do you do either of you think that's at all? a fair description of sort of today's relationship with the, the aristocratic side or the hierarchical side or the cruel side of a sort of pagan turn? I guess, well, I think, yeah, probably that is a fair description of what a lot of people would like to do. But I guess something that's a point that I think is relevant to that and to this kind of, um, oh, make your own religion, you know, kind of boutique uh, spirituality type of thing, you know, that we've been talking about is that... Um, that may be possible under certain circumstances and plausible. It might not be under all. I, I've been reading over the last couple of months um, some of the theologians around the early 20th century who were involved in the sort of fundamentalist modernist uh, controversy, and I don't remember which one said this, but someone said, during good times, Christians tend to favor the Greek side of their religion, and during bad times, they shift to the <coughs> Hindu side, uh, side of their religion. And there's something about this kind of spirituality that it seems to me is available when things are relatively prosperous, you know, when people have their good life, you know, their, their job or their position in the university or whatever, and then they can go down and enjoy a little spirituality of this kind or another. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think about Sam Harris and, okay, there's no free will, but, but I got my little app for meditation, and meditation is, you know, meditation's my, and meditation's my hobby, and, you know, it's okay to have this as a hobby, but I'm not sure that's sustainable under other kinds of circumstances. I think there can be circumstances that can push things in the direction of something more of a choice between, and again, I think that something like the scientific naturalism or the full-blown Christianity or other kinds of transcendent religion are just more intellectually coherent and rigorous positions than this kind of mushy middle fashion your own religion thing. And I'm not sure that things may not occur that might push us one way or the other. I, th that's why I'm just skeptical that that kind of thing that can flourish now for a time, you know, when most 
the, the middle class people and so forth that are probably doing that are relatively well off will necessarily be sustainable over the long haul. Now, and I think you know, looking overseas, we don't. You're you're going to find in in Africa and Latin America and Asia in again these these other communities. You're going to find that they do hit full blown religion usually and and inhabit that and, and and often you know folk religion alongside of you know the more developed more institutionalized religions like like Christianity um, and so and here here we get to the question about what do you need I mean is it is secular humanism more fragile than Christianity and, and I think what we're seeing is there's a degree of of, of a parasitic nature to it and 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 what you really need over the long haul are are a, a religion that has all of these elements and when i say you i mean us as a group as a society uh, something that's scalable it has to it has to work for the it has to work for the academic and for the philosopher it also has to work for the truck driver and the and the um the person, you know, it, it has to scale up and down the social spectrum, up and down the classes. It has to be emotionally satisfying. In fact, it has to be emotionally engaging. So it has to bring a tear to our eye. It has to move our heart. Our heart has to be warmed. It has to move us to give our money. It has to move us to sacrifice. It has to move us to do what we don't want to do. It's got to grip us in a way that that can't be. You know, it has to be all four P's. It has to be perspectival and participatory and procedural and propositional. I think they all come together to form a cohes cohesive, stable thing. It has to be communal. And and again, when all of these things line up and they're all working together, not just, oh, I have my little community over here. Oh, I have my ideas over here. Oh, I've got my institution over here. When it all comes together in one package, there's sort of a Voltron nature where the, the, the sum of its parts is the, the, the whole is much greater than just the the sum of its parts so it has to be communal has to be institutional has to be personal has to be generational has to be rich deep diverse but not merely psychological also has to be material it's got to basically pull the whole thing together yet stable enough yet diverse enough that it can handle the the ongoing and especially as as science and technology change, as as things turn, as cultures move, it's got to be able to hop cultures. And of course, you know what religion I think does all these, and I I do think it continues to be more than viable. And I think it frankly isn't going away, and will even suffer and endure the parasites upon it. So this has been quite long, and so I think I am gonna cut this up into two pieces and by the time you hear this you already know that so i don't know why i'm saying to it saying it so thanks for watching